Hello America, I'm Mark Levin and this is Life, Liberty and Levin and I've been waiting for you to see this show for several weeks. This is the interview of interviews with President Trump, an interview like you've never seen before. And I say this because he's come out with a new book called Letters to Trump. And he's got letters in this book from politicians and actors and entertainers and foreign leaders and sports stars. You're not going to believe the kinds of letters he got and what these people said. And during the course of this interview, we talk about these individuals and we apply it to current events and to history. The president does a fantastic interview if you let him speak. And that's exactly what I did. This interview was conducted literally minutes before the rogue prosecutor in Manhattan came down with his decision. So this was the last interview before that occurred. I really want you to check this out. And by the way, you can get the book at 45books.com, amazon.com. This is the exclusive first interview. And ladies and gentlemen, the book comes out on Tuesday. Enjoy. It's a pleasure to be in mar a This is a fantastic place. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, we're going to have a good time here. Um, I'm not Andrea Mitchell, as you can tell. I'm not Maggie Haberman. I'm not here to play games and tricks and all the rest. You have a book that's coming out that's a fantastic book, Letters to Trump. Throughout your life, throughout your career as a businessman, you're on TV, politics, as I went through this book, it's actually quite amazing. Sports, all these people writing you these letters. And they all love you. I want to talk about some of these people because this is really, it's a book of letters, but it's a fantastic history. And I think you can uh, help us talk about it a little bit too. Oprah Winfrey, she writes you three letters that you have in the book. She adores you. She writes, only a king knows how to treat a queen, you being the king, she being the queen. She would visit you at Mar-a-Lago often, and now she says, well, that was 20 years ago. What do you make of that? Well, I haven't changed, and my views haven't changed very much. I think I've been pretty consistent over the years. We want security. We want a great country. We want a strong military. We want borders, and we want good elections and education and housing and everything. I certainly haven't changed very much. I think the thing that changes I read for office, she actually says in one of her letters, I think somewhat kiddingly, but we should run together what a team would be. And I put that letter in the book. Uh, look, I got along great with her. She was here many times. In fact, Roger King, the great Roger King, King World, uh, she asked whether or not we could have his funeral here. That was probably one of the most important, maybe the most important, but one of the most important people in her life. And he was a fantastic man. He did an incredible job, a real character. He's a friend of mine also. We had his funeral here. It was held by Oprah. And she said, I just saw the most incredible place in the world called Mar-a-Lago. We have to have the funeral there. And, uh, you know, we don't do funerals, but we did one in that case. And it was amazing. Now, I had a great relationship with Oprah a great relationship with almost everybody. But once I went into politics, and I don't mean I said something offensive, but literally once I went in, it was, it changed. And that was okay because I just want to make our country great. I, you know, if, if they like me and then they don't like me, that doesn't bother me. I want to make our country great. But it is incredible when you look at the difference between those letters and now. Now, in some cases, people like me better. I will tell you, the public probably likes me better because we have tremendous support. We're in Texas, as you know, and we had an unbelievable crowd, record-setting crowds, record-setting like nobody's ever seen before. You saw it. We're doing very well, and we have to do well because if we don't do it, if we don't get this back, if we don't take our country back, we're not going to have a country. It's literally, we're not going to have its total chaos. It's a mess. Every single thing you see in the news, uh, Ukraine, Russia should have never happened. Inflation should have never happened. Every single thing, uh, the the way we pulled out of Afghanistan, where we gave $85 billion, billion, $85 billion worth of equipment, the best. You know, this they're the second largest arms dealer in the world right now. We gave it to them, brand new trucks, brand new planes, brand new uh, guns, rifles, 700,000 rifles and guns. Think of that, 700,000. They only need 40,000, probably not even that. So they're selling the rest, making a fortune. We left it there. And I was the one that was getting out. I got him down, you know, it was enough, 21 years, it was enough. 
And we didn't have anybody killed in the last 18 months. I spoke to Abdul, the leader. We had nobody killed. We had no, everybody understood. And we were going to get out with dignity and strength. Instead, I think it was the most embarrassing. I think it was the most embarrassing period, the way we withdrew. Not the fact that we withdrew, the way we withdrew from Afghanistan. And uh, I think Putin actually saw that, and he probably got a little more ambition, frankly. Let me ask you a question about that. You have really fascinating letters in here from Putin, from Xi, from Un in North Korea, you know, I can go on and on. And what I notice there's a common thread. You had a personal relationship with every one of these leaders, whether they're genocidal maniacs, whether they're elected, like Abe of Japan who was a close friend of yours and was assassinated. And I want to get into some of this. What would you say your foreign policy is? Because I think people keep projecting onto your foreign policy what it is that they think they want people to think your foreign policy is. What would you say it is? So I think more than anything else, and it was a very personal relationship, and you know, it's sort of a weird situation. The tougher they were, the better I got along with them. And that's probably a good thing, because it was the tough ones that had the, the big, powerful countries, the ones that could do destruction. And uh, when you look at what's going on now with the word nuclear, it's being thrown about every day. Every hour you hear nuclear, nuclear. You didn't hear that at all for four years when I was there. You don't discuss that word. That word is a bad word. A bad word, Mark, because the power is so unbelievable. This isn't a world war. This is the end of the world. I don't call it World War Three. I call it the end of the world. And we have people that have no idea what they're talking about or what they're doing. I look at now what's happening with Russia and the United States. They just grabbed a reporter, which is unheard of. They just, they're holding now a reporter. I guess that hasn't happened in many decades. Uh, what's going on, we are at, in my opinion, because of the power of weaponry, mostly nuclear, but other things also, we are in the most dangerous position we've ever been in as a nation right now. And we have a leader that just doesn't know what's going on. We have, he just doesn't know what's going on. And we want to be nice about it. Everybody wants to be nice about it. But the world is at, at balance. And this country what might not exist. I mean, we may not exist anymore because we're talking about power of weapons that is so unbelievable. I know better than anybody because I got to see it. And we have people that don't understand that. And they, they talk tough when they should be nice, and they talk nice when they should be tough. I mean, it's the opposite. Everything you see they say is just wrong. And it's a very scary time for this country. And it's scary primarily because of the leadership. I had I get great relationships with all of them. Uh, President Xi was very close to me. He was right here. He was right in this room. We spent a whole weekend together at Mar-a-Lago. We had tremendous talks. I made an incredible trade deal. Then COVID came along. I don't even talk about it. It was one of the greatest trade deals I ever made. Gave our farmers and manufacturers $50 billion. I got $28 billion cash for our farmers where they literally wrote out checks to my farm. China did. Nobody wants to talk about it. I got $28 billion for our farmers. That's why the farmers like me. That's why I'm not losing Nebraska and I'm not losing Iowa because they got... I mean, nobody ever even thought it was possible. 28 billion I got because they were taken advantage of and hurt by China. And I got it back in the form of taxes, tariffs, and other things, and with hundreds of billions left over. And no other president got 10 cents, and yet I got along with President Xi incredibly well. But I was stopping the rampage. It was the rape of America. That's what it was. It was the rape of America, what China was doing to us. And we had people leading that had no clue. They had no clue. I'm telling you, not 10 cents did we get from China. I got hundreds of billions of dollars. And I gave 28 billion of it to the farmers because they were really taken advantage of and hurt by China. And many other things. I mean, just USMCA, that's Mexico, Canada, got rid of NAFTA, one of the worst, probably the worst trade deal ever made. It was so one-sided. Now Canada and Mexico want to renegotiate the deal because it's a great deal. We shouldn't do it, by the way, because, you know, for many years they... They took advantage of us, and now we have a very good deal. I call it a fair deal, but they want to renegotiate it, meaning they're not happy. And nobody thought that was possible. But I would say it was peace through strength. I would say that they viewed us as a strong country. I think they probably didn't really figure me out because, you know, they were concerned about things. Uh, zero chance that Putin would have gone into Ukraine. I used to talk about it. But he knew not to go in, and he wouldn't have gone in. They don't respect our country anymore. 
they don't respect our leadership anymore. I had Iran in a position where they would have made a deal within one week after the election. Instead, they become very rich. And I saw, I told China, if you buy oil from Iran, they will buy massive amounts. If you buy oil, you're not going to do any business with the United States. And they were ripping us off for $507 billion. We had a trade deficit with China, $507 billion. I said, you buy any, any oil at all from Iran. And I said that to numerous other countries also. And Iran was coming to the table. They were dying to make a deal. And what I did getting us out of that horrible Iran nuclear deal, I, that was one of the best things I did for Israel. Between Golan Heights and between the embassy and Jerusalem, the capital, everything I did for Israel, the best thing I did was getting them out of that horrible Iran nuclear deal. The problem is the new administration blew it. They blew it and they allowed Iran to have a nuclear weapon. We have people that truly don't know what they're doing. This is the most dangerous time in the history of our country. And people talk about an election in a little while. You know, it's getting closer. But even if you said a year and a half, that's a long time. Because the most dangerous things now are happening. More dangerous. Did you see the other day where Putin is moving nuclear weapons right. into Belarus? Okay, nobody ever talks about that. They say, we're going to go there, we're going to do this, we're going to give a couple of bucks. And if you remember, I'm the one that gave the javelins to Ukraine. I gave all of the javelins, that's the anti-tank missiles, I gave them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Obama gave them sheets. Did you ever hear it? I gave javelins, he gave sheets. When I spoke to uh, the head of the Taliban, Abdul, I said, Abdul, you're killing a lot of people. Under Obama, they were doing snipers all over the place and killing our boys and killing our women and killing a lot of other people. It was very bad. And I said, you got to get this guy. I want to speak to this guy. And I took a lot of heat that I would speak to him. I tell the story, Jesse James, why do you rob banks? Jesse, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. Why do I speak to Abdul? From Because that's where the death is. That's where he was killing people. And I said, Abdul, great to speak to you. If you do any more killing, if you kill one more of our soldiers, we're going to hit you harder than anybody has ever been hit. And he actually said to me, but why, but why do you send me a picture of my home? I said, you'll have to figure that one out for yourself, Abdul. You'll have to figure that one out for yourself or ask one of your wives. From that point forward, we didn't have one soldier even shot at, not one soldier killed. And then when I was gone, they did the withdrawal. Millie should be court-martialed. They did a withdrawal where the people, think of this, Mark, this is where the soldiers came out first. If you asked a five-year-old child strategy, the soldiers, the soldiers come out last. They were so afraid of our F-16s and our fighter jets. We had brand new, I rebuilt the whole, the whole thing. I had brand new gorgeous stuff. We had stuff that was 48 years old. They were so afraid of it. They would just run back when they heard this with those engines. Now they own those planes. They own those planes, Mark. And I said to these people when I was getting ready to pull out, I said, I want every nail. I want every screw. I want every bolt. I want all the canvas from the tents. What do you mean the tents, sir? I want those big, massive tents. They're like hangers with canvas uh, covers, steel. I want all of that. I want the tanks. I want the planes. I want the guns. I want everything. I don't want you to leave a screw or a bolt. And then Millie said to me, sir, I think it's easier if we left or left everything. I said, why? It's cheaper. I said, so let me ask you, we have a $150 million airplane. We have to fill it up with a tank of gas, put a little fuel in there. You say it's cheaper to leave the plane than it is to fly it to Pakistan and then take it back home or fly it to some other place that we get along with and take it back home or fly it directly? We're going to give them a hundred million, hundred and fifty million dollar plane because you think it's cheaper? It's not cheaper. These are stupid people we have. These are stupid people. They take the military out before we take our hostages out because they're hostages. The American people now are hostages. The book is Letters to Trump, 45books.com. It's a great book. I recommend you grab it. We'll be right back. Welcome back, America. Mr. President, let me ask you a question. 
as I read the letters in the book, letters to Trump, uh, back and forth, you had uh, a lot of letters also before you were in government with Richard Nixon. I counted 25 letters. And you seem to like Nixon, not necessarily all his, his foibles, but you like the way the man was smart, the man would think things through. Tell us about Nixon and what it was about him that appealed to you and what it was about him that didn't so much appeal to you. So I respect him. I mean, he was actually a very smart person. He was accepted into big, the best colleges, and he couldn't go there because he didn't have literally the train fare. I don't know if you ever heard that story, but he could have gone to the to the great colleges, I won't mention the names, but I hear he was accepted to numerous of the great colleges, didn't have any money at all, and he went to his college, and because it was near his place of birth, but he was actually a very smart guy. He had a temperament that maybe wasn't suited for a lot of things, and there was this really bad story in the Washington Post about Nixon, and Nixon was furious. He was just angry. He wanted to go there. He wanted to go and attack it. He was going to go to the Washington Post. He said, you can't do that. You're president. No, I'm going to go there and confront this writer. And they had a hard time with him. And then there was an equally bad story about Reagan. And everybody was angry about it, except Reagan. He said, don't worry about it. They'll forget about it next week, you know. It's just a different personality. And Nixon was very smart. Uh, I didn't know him well, but I had dinner with him a few times. He liked me. I was hot at the time. I was uh, a real estate developer. I had, I did a couple of books. The Art of the Deal was the best, the best seller. I mean, it was a big monster book. It still is. Uh, but a lot of my books, I mean, they sell very well. But uh, Nixon and I, I got to know him. Uh, he was a very tough guy. He was, I guess some people would say this about me too, he was his own worst enemy. I mean, I could say that a little bit about myself, much less so than people think, I will say. But um, he was um, sort of a paranoid guy. And that's okay, you know, you keep your guard up. That's, I don't say that badly. Uh, his views on Henry Kissinger were very interesting. I won't tell you exactly. I get along pretty well with Kissinger, but I, I tell you his views on Henry Kissinger were not so hot. And uh, he was a tough guy, and he, he, they went over to tell him that you have to get out. His biggest regret, according to his daughters, and I think according to him pretty much, was that he didn't fight. They went over there one evening, Barry Goldwater headed up the delegation, and they had some senators and some congressmen, and they went over to tell him he's got to get out. And he left the following day or the following morning, and his biggest regret was that he didn't fight. Mm -hmm. Because it wasn't really like him. And I find that very interesting. And his daughter, when I got impeached twice by uh, really crooked, disgusting politicians, you know, they just happen to have a majority and they, the Democrats do stick together and they, on a perfect phone call, think of it, on a perfect phone call, mm -hmm. this was a call that, I remember Tim Scott, the senator from South Carolina, read this. He was the first one to say, he read the call because I had it. It was taped. The call was taped. He said, he didn't say anything wrong. He was saying, like, what did he do wrong? It was a perfect call. It was a congratulatory call. But I'll never forget, uh, when that happened, we had such great support. Nixon had no support. You know, he just didn't have support. He was very, very tough with people. Uh, I get along with people. I mean, I, I have great Jim Jordan and all these congressmen are great. They're really incredible people. They're fighters, too. We have some great fighters. People don't realize it. You'll see that, I think. But we have some incredible fighters. Uh, Nixon didn't get along with uh, the people in Congress. He didn't get along with the senators. But the fact is, we have some great people in the Republican Party. But I get along with them. And they stuck together. But Reagan, if you look at, if you go back, and, and some of the most interesting conversations I had with Nixon but with his daughter, too, because, you know, I'd speak to the family. Uh, they asked me would I give him or consider giving him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And I thought it was a very interesting request. I said, let me get out of some of these little things first. But, uh, you know, he was, he was a brave guy. When I was going through impeachment, I knew I was going to win. I didn't do anything wrong. And I had no darkness. There was, like... People are saying, you, you really, you're very happy. I said, yeah, I'm happy. I've got a great group of people that are supporting me, including a first lady that's 
fantastic. It was very popular, by the way. Very, very popular. I go, I made a speech the other day, and they have songs. We love our first lady. They do love our first lady. They like everything that I brought to the table, and they like what we did. You know, we had the greatest economy in history. We had the greatest economy in the history of the world. We were lapping China. China was going to catch us in 2018 for 20 years. That was the year they were going to catch us. And they were on track to do that. And I took our country to a new level economically. It was incredible what we did. But especially during that period prior to COVID, uh, we had the greatest economic machine in history. There's never been anything like it. Uh, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, women, men, everything. Uh, you have a degree from MIT, the Wharton School of Finance, and Harvard. And you had the greatest job. You had no degree, and you had the greatest job. You didn't go to high school, and you had the greatest job. If you had a high school diploma, you did great. We never had a period. We had 161 million people working. We've never had that before, even more than that. So we had a period of time, and we can do it again. The problem we have, though, is right now we're allowing millions and millions of people into a country, and many of those people, I don't want to sound like a bad person, but many of those people come from prisons. Many of those people come from mental institutions, insane asylums. They say, don't use that word. It's not a nice word. But they're being led into our country. And I saw recently there was an article, a doctor in a South American country, a psychiatrist. He said, you know, I've worked 24 hours a day my whole life. I don't have anything to work because they've let all the patients out. They're all in America. And he wasn't saying it even as a bad thing. He was just making a statement. I said, isn't it said?" They're emptying out their mental institutions into our country. Biden. Biden is doing it. They're emptying out their prisons. MS-13. Not that I discriminate against, but when you have a man with lots of tattoos on his face, historically it's not the greatest thing in the world, okay? But they're letting all of the MS-13 people out and pushing them into our country. They're already here, by the way. So you go into these countries and their prisons are empty and they're... You know what the money, I mean, number one, the trauma and everything, but you know the money they're saving? Forget about the money that we subsidize. The money that they're saving, Mark, is so incredible. Their prisons are empty and their mental institutions are empty and these people are all living in this country. We're going to be paying a tremendous price for this. Mm -hmm. But we'll do something about that. It's a real big problem, what they're doing in the world. I had the safest border in the history of our country, in the recorded history. My last year, our numbers were incredible, and that included drugs and human trafficking. We had the lowest human trafficking numbers in 37 years, and we had the lowest drug numbers. I mean, we, we had numbers for drugs that were the lowest that they've seen in so long. Now, drugs are 12 times higher than they were just a couple of years ago. Think of it coming in. There's nobody to even stop them. I was buying the best equipment in the world. You know, the best equipment for detecting drugs, you know what it is? A certain type of German Shepherd dog. <laughs> and we had a lot. There is no machine that's better than it. It can sniff it. It's the most incredible thing you've ever seen. It can be in the hubcaps. They put them in the cylinders. They spend millions of dollars on equipment, but there's nothing like a particular dog, German Shepherd. It can, it's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. Actually, the machinery is only okay, despite the cost. But the dog is 100% foolproof. And we had, we had our borders protected, and we had stay in Mexico, and we had all sorts of things. You have bad health, you can't come in, you have this, that. We had it, it was at a level. Uh, you know, we have fantastic people on the Border Patrol and ICE. Uh, we had, uh, you know, Brandon Judd is incredible, and Tom Holman, my people, Tom Holman, incredible. They said this was the greatest we've ever seen. Now you see them on television, they're saying, it's totally out of control. We'll be right back. Now, I want the audience to know, a lot of this information's in the book via letters, back and forth to politicians, world leaders, and so forth. And the letters are fascinating. You can go to 45books.com to order the book. Letters to Trump, 45books.com. You know, I read a lot. I research a lot, I study a lot, I've never really seen anything like this. This is really firsthand. We talked about Nixon and foreign policy, but you were buddies, kind of, with Ted Kennedy. Yeah. John Jr. Kennedy. Yeah. Not all the Kennedys. No. 
but but ten in particular because he was down in Palm Beach and so forth. Tell us about that. It's in the book. So I, I had a very good relationship with him for some reason. I mean, we were different in terms of philosophy, but at that time it didn't matter that much. I was a real estate developer primarily, and uh, I did him a favor. It wasn't such a big thing, but to him it was a big thing. I was able to help him on something, and for some reason he really liked it. It was quite important to him. To somebody else I'd say maybe it wasn't that important, but it had to do with his family, and I helped him. And he was very loyal in that sense. And I got along with him very, very well. Um, and, you know, he, had, he went on to have a lot of problems. I would have said he would have been president someday, but the Chappaquiddick was terrible and, you know, went through a lot. But I got to know him primarily because of Palm Beach and, and a little bit Washington, although I wasn't a Washington person. Uh, I got to know John Kennedy very well, John John. Uh, fantastic. I think he would have been president. I think he was, you know, he was selling, he had a magazine named George, and he was going to be selling that. He wanted to get out. His mother wanted him to go into politics really strongly. He wanted to be an actor. And he loved the concept of being an actor. And he was a handsome guy, a very handsome guy. And I think he probably would have been good at whatever he wanted to do. He was with Carol, Caroline. He just, uh, I knew him before he got married, after he got married. They fought like cats and dogs, but they loved each other. This was a uh, different than your relationship with your beautiful wife. But they fought, and then I'd say, this isn't going to work out, and then you'd see them hugging and kissing, right? So, you know, they had a ra rather volatile relationship, as the expression goes. But, uh, but it was fine. It worked. And then they got onto that plane, and it was just a disaster. But he would have, uh, he was getting ready to, I think he would have run for the Senate from New York or someplace, but probably New York. They wanted to do it. And he was he was all set for that. And his mother really wanted him to do that. And, you know, had a great look, handsome, very handsome, very handsome guy at the top of the top of the line, really. And I think he probably would have done well and he would have gone on. He probably would have been president. I think he would have been president. You have a long letter in here from Alec Baldwin, who really was a big fan of yours. It's true. <laughs> So what happened? You're Republican, Politics. you run for office, yeah. and now he is full of contempt. Full of contempt. Politics. I don't know about now. Now he's got different kinds of... He's got his own issues. He's yeah. got a couple of issues. Yeah. So you just, you think it's it's the mentality. That's well, politics. It's one team and another team. Yeah. Uh, look, you, you run for office, and uh, I, I ran as a Republican. I'm proud of that. I'm conservative guy. I'm really not, it's not so much, you know, people say, are you conservative? Yeah, I'm conservative, but I'm a common sense person. Um, no, I, I think uh, it's been an interesting life. You know, I, I looked at the book the other night and I, I'm proud of it. It's, it's, it's great. a great book. I've had thousands and thousands of letters sent to me over the years. And I had two women that were terrific. Uh, one was Norma, Norma Footer. The other was Rona Graf, and they worked. Rona was young, and, and she was working with Norma for years. And then when Norma passed away, she, she was there right almost up until the end. She was a fantastic woman. And then Rona did such an incredible job. And they, they saved every letter. Andrew Lloyd Webber writing me a letter. Which is in the book. Which is in the book that uh, essentially, kind of I'm opening a new musical. He lived in Trump Tower with Sarah Brightman, was his wife. They fought pretty good, too. <laughs> But I will tell you, he, so he writes me a letter. I'm opening up a new musical in New York. It's called Phantom of the Opera. We're having opening night in a month or whatever it was. And I'd love you to go. And I say, OK, you know, I'll go. And then I went and I heard the sound. I said, that's unbelievable. You know, and it became one of the most successful things. But it was an interesting letter because it's sort of like I'm opening a musical called Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. And uh, it says, I think it's going to be quite good. Here's the book, Letters to Trump. It's a beautiful book. You can go to 45books.com to get your copy. We'll be right back. You had a lot of sports figures, too. You yeah. really liked Arnold Palmer, didn't you? Oh, Arnold was great. Arnold was, Arnold was a, a great man, in the sense. And I'll never forget, you know, he was a very wealthy man. He was, he was a, an amazing uh, athlete, amazing golfer, and... Uh, if you look at his career, how, how he did, you know, he just, he was an instant star. Mark McCormick, you know Mark McCormick from IMG, and he was a golfer, and he wanted to be a touring pro, 
And he went to a certain school, and Arnold Palmer went to Wake Forest, and they got into a match together. And Mark McCormick, you know who I'm talking about, yeah. right? He was the, he's the founder of IMG, which turned out to be, I guess, the biggest agency or whatever. But his first client was, was Arnold Palmer. But, but Mark didn't want to do that. He didn't even think about that. He wanted to be a professional golfer. Now he's playing Arnold Palmer in a match. And somebody on the 10th hole shouts over, Mark, how are you doing? He said, I'm playing great. How's your score? I'm five down. <laughs> he said, this guy is impossible. I can't beat this guy. And he realized after one round that you know, he was never going to be able, he wasn't long enough, he wasn't strong enough, he didn't put his what chip his way, didn't do anything as well. He said, that, that's the end of my, he thought he, was, he thought he was good until he met Arnold. Then he said, Arnold, and Arnold went on to win the U.S. Amateur, and then he went on to be a great pro. He said, I'd love to represent you. And they started, and Arnold owned a piece of IMG. And Arnold owned a piece of the Golf Channel. Arnold was a very rich guy, but he was he was an unbelievable person. And I'll never forget, I was doing a commercial for something, and Arnold Palmer was there. I never met him. And he was standing in the background putting, because he was in a tournament. And this company that's doing the commercial said, Sir, do you think you could ask Arnold Palmer to be in the commercial? I said, I don't think he's going to do that. He just spent a lot of money to do that. And I said, but let me ask him. I said, hi, Arnold. I'm Donald Trump. Hey, Arnold, would you do me a favor? Could you say a few words? I'm doing a little commercial. Do you mean, absolutely, Donald. Absolutely. He called me Donald. Absolutely, Donald. Absolutely. And I had Arnold Palmer in a commercial. He didn't say, you got to pay me. And he got paid a lot of money. No, Arnold was a great star. And you know a lot of athletes who like you a lot. Shaquille O'Neal. They're on the book, of course, of uh, Jack Nicholas yeah. and others. And that's something that's been your passion, hasn't it? I remember UFC or MMA, which I'm kind of obsessed with for some reason. Well, we have great people. We have, I mean, you take a look at uh, what they've done at Dana White, UFC. Uh, you look at what Vince McMahon has done with Linda, with, you know, with the whole thing with the wrestling. WWE used to be WWF and then... They had a, somebody sued him, and they ended up with WWE. But, you know, you look at the great job that Vince McMahon and Linda have done, unbelievable. Yeah. Dana White has been unbelievable with UFC. He's an incredible guy. I don't know if he's replaceable even. But uh, the job he's done at UFC is, I like that. You know, I just enjoy it. But the job they've done is incredible. These We have people that are unbelievable entrepreneurs. The one thing I find they all have in common, they love what they're doing. Vince and Dana and all of these people that, you know, do what they do. They just, it's such a passion. It's so incredible. And they therefore have great knowledge. You know, they understand it and they have great knowledge. But they truly do have a great love and enthusiasm for what they do. I've never seen anybody be, be successful or certainly be very successful without that incredible enthusiasm. Lots of letters in this book. Many will surprise you. Get it at 45books.com. We'll be right back. Ron Welcome back, America. Mr. President, let me ask you a question. You had a pretty good back and forth letters and relationship with Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and you always got along with Bill Clinton. So, uh, you got along early on with Hillary Clinton, but then you know how that turned out, 2016 and so forth. They came to my wedding. They came to your wedding. Well, what do you make of that? That's politics to you? It's politics too. It's all politics. Uh, I never forgot, you know, he loved, I own a course in Westchester, and he loved that course. He was there a lot. He just loved it. He loved playing golf. And he was any good. Uh, better than people think. You know, they say no, but he's he's got a certain athleticism, actually. Mm -hmm. Better than people think. And uh, we used to play, but I'll never forget, this is before I even thought in terms of politics for myself, but we had played around, and uh, we were sitting in the clubhouse, and he was telling me stories about politics and telling me his views on this and this. I said, you know, two and a half hours have gone by, and he's, he just loved it, talk about enthusiasm. I mean, I think they did a great disservice by not using him. When I went with 
you know, it went against Hillary. I think that uh, they had this unbelievable weapon known as Bill Clinton, who was a natural politician. And I know for a fact, he called in, he said, you know, I'm in Michigan and we got Trump signs all over the place and you got to do so. You better send somebody out. He says, no, we're not going to have a problem with Michigan. And he called in about Wisconsin. He said, you know, I'm here and we're making trips to a convention center. Every house has a Trump sign on it. You're going to have to get some people out here, Wisconsin. They said, no, no, no. The polls indicate that he can't win Wisconsin. And they ended up winning Michigan and Wisconsin. And he said to them, you have to come out here. She never made a trip to Wisconsin because it was automatic Democrat territory. And, you know, by now, it, maybe it's a well-known story, but he very much, and they, he very much wanted them to go to Michigan again, and they wanted to go, they, they never went to Wisconsin. And they said, you're going to lose this state. He said it, you're going to lose this state. He had an instinct, he had a natural instinct, like people do. People that are good at things have a lot of instinct. And it was very interesting, and they never went. And I won Wisconsin, I won Michigan, but he knew that. And I had heard what's going on and he wanted them to go so badly. And I was hoping they wouldn't go because I thought we were going to win those places. Uh, but he was a, uh, a weapon that they decided not to use. They actually did the opposite. They shut him out. They shut him out. And I think that was a mistake. How to grow more vibrant flowers. Waco, streaming now. Let me just say this, Mr. President. I've talked to a lot of important people. Supreme Court justices, presidents, presidential candidates, brilliant people. And talking with you is really the most impressive conversation I've had. Number one, there's very few people who could sit there and speak the way you do from subject to subject to subject to subject. If people would let you speak and actually listen to you, while you have the enormous pressure on your shoulders of these grand juries and other things going on, and you still are able to do it, that is absolutely remarkable. And as you go through the history of your presidency, and I read these letters in this book, it was a phenomenal presidency. Phenomenal presidency. And the reason you don't get the credit that you deserve is because perhaps that's going to be up to history. When people look back and say, wait a minute, he was right about this, and this, and this, and so forth. What happened is you upset the apple cart. That is, Hillary was supposed to win and she was supposed to be the third term of Obama. And they never forgave you. And we're facing a period in history now, somebody who studies history very carefully, where the country is facing very dangerous change. We're regressing. Uh, and regressing towards what you call correctly this Marxist ideology. And so you're not going to get a fair break from the people in Washington and the media. They want you to do what Republicans normally do, roll over and play dead. And that's clearly not in your personality. I want you to know this is a fantastic book, Letters to Trump, and I encourage people to get it so you can see what, who Donald Trump, who you were speaking with throughout your life and throughout your career and what they were saying without anybody interfering and involved interpreting it for anybody else. So I want to thank you for all the time you've given us here, and uh, it's been a tremendous honor. Well, thank you very and much, Mark. God bless you. my great honor. Thank you very much. And one other thing. Go to the very end of the book, and you'll see my wife and me. <laughs> the very end of the book. Two right, great Americans go to with godly principles. And get a copy. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next time on Life, Liberty, and Levin. <laughs>